All right, guys, we've just uh, finished playing music, and um, we're going to do our off-the-cuff uh, philosophy of music intersection conversation. We have no script. I don't even know what we're going to talk about. Down in the basement, while we were working on a composition, CJ um, mentioned some idea concerning dullness, what it means for something to be dull or boring, uh, what, those, what those terms mean, and if there's a way for there to be beauty in the boring aspect of art. I don't know. I'm going to shut up. Yeah, I mean, let you talk about I I started thought, talk, thinking about this from an anecdote of a British writer named Samuel Johnson, and he was having a discussion with his biographer Samuel Boswell, and and they were talking about this poet named Thomas Gray, and. Boswell said, hey, San, you know, Johnson, I think as much as we can discount him as a man, and Thomas Gray isn't really known to be a really friendly figure, and say, okay, maybe he was dull as a man, but we can't deny that he was a great poet. And then Samuel Johnson responds, and I have to read it verbatim. Yeah, please do. And he says... Sir, he was dull in company, dull in his closet, dull everywhere. And this is the part that was fascinating to me. He was dull in a new way, and that made people think him great. He was a mechanical poet. So that idea of that you can be dull in a new way, and people will take that to be quote-unquote great, I, I found that very fascinating especially in light of any kind of popular music, when maybe we kind of think of that, at least its reception, as maybe people getting excited over something that's already been given to them, but it's in a new gloss. Just like Johnson said, it's dull, but in a new way, and that's why people take it in and why they think it's great. So that... That was sort of the catalyst to think about dullness. You you kind of gave a nice little well, yeah. insight there, but you know, I'm wondering I'm wondering if we can bring this into any kind of well, philosophical discussion. I have no idea, but well, I think what was really interesting about it is the way that you were talking about it downstairs is that in pop music you have this repackaging of the same old material. Now I think you were using I don't, I don't know if you care if I name names or anything like that, but like I think you 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 found sort of Adele to be boring, that she was sort of this amalgamation of other artists, just maybe some different branding or something like that. Um, and then I sort of commented that I, in pop music, I find, I, I find this appropriation of Americana music by sort of this new grass stuff um, to be pretty boring. Um, it just kind of seems like people are aping something that is not their own. Um, so there is that sort of like, dullness where we can't sort of get our minds sort of engaged with it or whatever. But the other thing that I found really interesting about it is like, I love some music that is like boring. Mm -hmm. I love really boring music. Um, and specifically, I mean, I, I, I think someone we've mentioned a lot here is like, do you know how boring Brian Eno's music is and how uneventful it is? And, or I, I, I was listening to the new Tim Hecker record. I love him. He's probably my favorite ambient artist. And so much of that music is predicated on glacial development and uneventful. So in a sense... So, so do you think then that that's boring? I mean, maybe... Or dull? I guess maybe that's... Or I'm curious about what, what makes something... I mean, does that make it good? I mean, does it, does it matter if something's dull? Can something still be beautiful if it's dull? I, I guess is that what you're I, I think I'm in? saying. I, I think there is a type of boring that can be beautiful. And there can be a type of boring that can be totally uninteresting. Mm. So, this, so I guess I would say there would be beautiful boring and boring boring? Or no, sorry. this is interesting. We have to. I think this is a, a distinction worth exploring. Yeah. Because so, maybe maybe we think of boring as in a good boring, almost. If we had to compare it to nature, and maybe nature watching watching Na a glacier, Na watching the trees. Just nature is incredibly boring. 
Yeah. But it's also incredibly beautiful. I think there are probably a lot of, and it, that could bring out what's so, the boring beautifulness of, <laughs> of ambient music, at least in my opinion. Uh, and maybe we can say, it can say something about the boring, boring pop music. Now, I even think that the, 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 our, our, the course that we're building on Roland Barthes' camera Lucida could probably speak to the boring beautifulness of, of ambient music. I mean, I think what happens, like if we were to transpose some of the terminology from, from Barth or whatever, I, I've been starting to think about this ambient music in regards to photographs. Mm -hmm. That there are sort of these photographs in my mind that in sort of the general studium is set and a general sort of theme is announced and then like gradually something new is introduced to it this open wound this punctum mm -hmm. that animates a lot of my interest i see that happening a lot in the ambient music but but I also think you have to say that okay maybe that's not the only source of the animating beauty of that type of boringness I guess we have to say why do we find why do we find the boringness of nature so beautiful and why might we find this type of boringness so beautiful in music? What, what is right. beautiful about nature? Like when you contemplate nature, why do you find it beautiful? Could it could it be maybe something with the sublime, perhaps, well, which I might might beg to be defined. Yeah, but, it has to be defined. But I, I think you really touched on a point. Maybe uh, it seems like I'm sidetracking this question oh, here, fine. but I think you touched on a really fascinating point that ambient music at least sets up this kind of expectation, and maybe this sort of gloss, almost like a, like the sea or like a lake, where it's just this straight, just mirror, and then all of a sudden. A rock is thrown, or there's no. it's just drop it. Oh, yeah, and that that maybe is the surprising moment in the piece, or some kind of sound that just oh, get grabs your attention, or maybe that's not a maybe that's just a feeling over time that you that you experience that maybe it isn't just one noise, maybe it's just the experience as a whole that makes you feel that way, but. I think you can even stretch that to other types of music too. Maybe not just ambient music, but maybe other music that takes this glacial form, but maybe puts it more in regards to form or where they're okay. It's like pop. It's like chorus, verse, chorus, verse. You know, they have a certain structure, yeah. but that then there's these moments or these things that are unnameable or undescribable, undescribable that just makes us want to listen more, mm. wants us to love it. And but yeah, maybe, I, yeah. I can think of an example of that. Have you have you heard any of the new Savages record? The the lead single off of it is called Adore, and mm -hmm. it's like I, I think it's like a waltz, like for the first three quarters of the song. Mm -hmm. I find it totally uninteresting. If it were me, I would just lop off the front of it. And keep the ending. The ending is this such dramatic crescendo where she repeats, I adore life, I adore life, I adore mm -hmm. life. And it's like it's this whelming up of 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 emotion. I'm just like, why couldn't they just make a whole song out of that? But I it, it, we're not i I'm not saying that pop music in general is boring. Because mm -hmm. I they definitely I think there are ways to pervert the the template to make it interesting, to defy those expectations. And we've talked about that in regards to sonatas and stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. The point that I wanted to get at when I was asking you about like why you find nature beautiful, and I think you'd have to dis distinguish the beauty of nature and the beauty of any of these forms of music and their boringness and the sublime. The sublime is kind of like a a harrowing, trembling kind of yeah, effect. where there's a terror in the beauty, which right. maybe maybe doesn't describe boring. Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think so. I don't think the sublime would apply to this. But I think the thing is, is that there's something about the boringness of of ambient music, observing nature, or whatever that allow allows the mind to. I guess I guess set itself off on some kind of adventure. So even though the thing that that is being fed through the senses or whatever, the cogitation and the meditation that one does when con confronting nature or this type of music is so hyper engaging that I think that even though one is 
consuming something that may be boring in a way, the thoughts that come out of that situation are the most exhilarating ones. Like I know, I know like a lot of philosophers like Nietzsche would go hiking in the Alps and things like that. And that's where he would get like so many ideas, right? Like it would be absolutely invigorating. Hell, like I've gotten tremendous insights by like mowing the yard, mm -hmm. like the repetition of just going up and down, up and down. Like, and I've had some of the greatest philosophical and musical breakthroughs doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's something about that boring that frees up the mind to have epiphanies or something like that. And then it doesn't be, and that's, and, and that's, I don't know. I wonder if that's the beauty in those situations. Yeah, I know. Um, I think this is a really great point. And I think Martin Heidegger has something to say about that too. He has this um, essay about works of art. I haven't really gotten too deep into it, but he stresses one point that that a work of art creates space for insight, or I guess for experience. That it actually that you know, in spatially, it creates. Space. So I'm wondering maybe with the boring for us, and I think like you're implying, creates the space for further inquiry or epiphanies or insights of any kind of nature. Yeah. I mean, it almost goes to um, how we were talking about um, listening to music you know, with Nietzsche and how he would say like, yeah, I go to the, you know, I go to opera and I just write as I, you know, as I enjoy the concert. And he says, I think he's like, you know, Bizet makes me a better philosopher. Where maybe music in some sense, or, you know, even, even if it's quote-unquote boring music, gives you this kind of space, I guess in Heidegger's sense, to do, or to, yeah, to have a interesting experience, whether that be mentally or physically. You, know, you can even think of dance music as well, where... It doesn't necessarily go, I mean, some senses it's boring because it has to be because it's, you know, the same be doom, 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 and there are some variations, but the expectations are there. So, may, but that gives you more room to then, it gives you space to have freedom to maybe be creative with your dance moves or to join in a communal kind of ecstasy. So I wonder if maybe maybe boring creates space. I guess. I think so. I think the question is, what about space induces the ecstasy of epiphany, mm -hmm. right? And that and I think that's a really interesting question. Maybe it's obvious to everybody. Why, when I got on the lawnmower and rode around in circles, did that lead to this tremendous insights? Mm -hmm. Why, when I put on the ambient record, like what about those conditions precipitates insight? Mm -hmm. So what, so I, what I'm trying to say here is cognitively, what's going on? Yeah. Like, I know a lot of people talk about going out into nature to clear their minds. Or people talk about doing something perfunctory to clear their minds. Or listening to something ambient or whatever to clear their minds. So what does that mean to clear one's mind? Yeah, or whether that's even possible. I mean, that's another interesting thing, too. I... I've been thinking a lot about about that, or this this dichotomy between solitude and sociability. I guess. I mean, I mean, the book that I took the Johnson anecdote from is is a little history of conversation. And That's kind of, awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's really, really fascinating. I mean, it used like it. Has Maybe we'll be a footnote one day. <laughs> yeah, no, but. Um, it talks about this idea between, you know, sociability and solitude and how conversation at least was seen or sociability was kind of seen by some, especially like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, as this sort of frivolous sort of foppery in some sense that it was not really helping anyone gain insight. It was just more just kind of a veil over any kind of actual truth. And that, at least in Rousseau's case, you know, if we're talking philosophy and you know, Rousseau, but he 
wanted to go into nature and to be by himself and to take walks by himself and do all that. That's where he saw insight. And yet at the same time, I can, I can think of, you know, having conversations with you or with anybody else and then having solitude and having not so much epiphanies, but having a very fruitful time by myself. So in the sense that solitude or these like, epiph I think there's this weird thing going on between like an outside stimulation and then being by yourself. You know, where I, I don't think you can just like be by yourself or you can't just be constantly stimulated all the time by sociability, that there needs to be this kind of mix and that they both complement each other. And whether that actually helps with this discussion, I'm not really sure. I think but it I, does. I think it does. I, I'll draw... Maybe, maybe the music, maybe music in some sense, or the art, the boring art, maybe gives us something to come or maybe it gives us space to contemplate things maybe it is it is a solitude in itself or maybe it acts like a social thing i'm not sure i don't know if you well have any... yeah well i'll say this i i used to i stopped going to bars okay. when i was 24 i would go to bars and i would sit down and i never really drank very much then. I don't at all now. And um, I didn't particularly care to get annihilated. Um, so I would go to these bars and what I would try to do is I'd try to have engaging conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And I soon realized that that was absolutely impossible. The music was thumping. There was too many other conversations going on. I couldn't have anything of substance. So like the conversations were like, this place is cool. Yeah, it is. Dude. Like, and... That type of thing, it made me feel like a dumb animal. It afflicted my dignity. It made me feel crappy about myself. It made me feel like I had stopped aspiring to be something more than um, like a groundhog, you know. Um, but I, I, so I think that probably pushed me to do more solitude things to like play more drums to be to make music production to work on philosophy to be more kind of reclusive to be honest and i think i don't know if i figured out quite yet what the boringness of these things and how that precipitates inspiration but i know that it does because i'll get i am so inspired right now all right i think it's probably the most impassioned time in my entire life i would say and, and I, I'm exploding with ideas, philosophical, entrepreneurial ones, musical ones. And really the motivation to interact with others comes from the, comes from this impulse of them, of it teeming too much within me. And that I just need to share it with somebody like you or Jordan through these podcasts and whoever else is interacting with us. Um, so I, so that you were asking about that balance and that shifting dynamic. I can tell you the 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 external buzz of everyone drove me to solitude but then the, it creates a buzz within my head that drives me towards sociability mm -hmm. i'm still trying to figure out what it means to have that clearing to have that space and and getting all those insights like what what are the mechanics of the mind like why is it that that stuff is setting the stage for us to have the epiphany mm -hmm. you know like what is what is going on there? That's what I'm grasping at. Maybe I'm being a broken record by keep going back to it, but I don't, I know what happens. I just don't know the connection yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's someone listening. She's like, wants to jump through the, no, the, the speakers mean, you mean and the, tell me. You mean the connection between solitude and the inspiration. Yeah. And inspiration. Is, I mean, perhaps is it lack of distractions? Like when we, subtract, when we subtract distractions, mm -hmm. does that, does that just allow for the, the brain to, stimulate itself perhaps it does i mean and when you think of solitude too you think of of having the time just to go over everything in your head and to kind of have ideas whether they be subconsciously or consciously kind of meld together and maybe form insights that you didn't have when you were talking to somebody in person so i mean 
maybe that's maybe that's part of it is that it gives you this space again it gives you space to have maybe insights that you wouldn't have if you're you know being constantly sociable but I, I don't want to underscore the importance of actually being sociable which I mean I think is very important um, Sherry Turkle who's a great um, psychologist and social critic and technology critic and she she talks about the idea of of conversation being a, a way to have a more fruitful solitude in the sense that it just gives you more things to think about. I mean, I'm sure you think of a lot of things that you talked about with other people after you had a conversation and then you're driving in your car. I think like anybody does, you know, you're driving in your car and you're thinking, oh, of all the things that that person said and the great conversation that you had, you know, in some sense or another. I, I think I think maybe having that that sort of thing gives you space to think. Or having having solitude gives you Having conversation and then solitude gives you space. It gives creates this different sort of amalgamation of things that makes you want to, ha or makes you have these insights. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what's, I think what's really interesting about what we're stumbling upon here, right, is if we sub if there's a subtraction of social stimulation, and, and and you and I are on the same page. I think there's a there is value in sociability, right? Like, like I was saying before, like if I didn't have you to confess all my ideas to, I mean, I might just go scrawl on the walls. They might've locked me up a long time ago. And there's probably a lot of people out there that feel the exact same way who are just like, God, man, I just need a friend to like divulge all these secret epiphanies that I'm having. Mm -hmm. Um, what I think is really interesting that we have such an overload of sociability in this day and age. And I think there've been some books that were written about it, but I don't know if it, it's been done in this, in this new era of hyper social media. Oh yeah. yeah I mean, like, the, the book I, I mean, the book I was thinking about, um, I guess with Sherry Turkle, she has this book, um, I believe it's called reclaiming conversation, which talks about bringing back human to human. I mean, I mean, again, not, not that it's already dead or anything, but she kind of talks, she talks but it about is the in a idea. way, isn't it? Like think about like, like we are so hyper connected, mm -hmm. but yet, like, I think people feel more alienated from one another than ever. Sure. I mean, maybe yeah. that's just me. Oh, sure. And I yeah. do like being alone together. Yeah, yeah. It's there's like that book Bowling Alone that I've heard yeah. about. Stuff like that mm -hmm. is that that I we you know we may have like thirty five hundred friends or twelve hundred friends on our friend list or something like that, but we don't feel like anyone understands us, and it's exacerbated by the social media sort of inter interconnectivity. It hasn't really addressed that fun fundamental social need. And I guess what I worry about with all this social stimulation, are people bombarded to the extent where they they feel like I did it that far when I was 24. And I just like, I had this epiphany when I was 24, bars make me feel miserable, mm -hmm. you know? And I just and I never went back. I never went back. So is that almost kind of like the bad boring that we're talking about? Yeah, or maybe. I, I, maybe that's well, part of it. Or I don't know. Maybe I, it's not. Because it's a hyperactivity. What I'm trying to say is, is that I think this collective buzz of the internet or whatever makes people feel terrible about themselves in mm -hmm. some way because um, there's so much stimulation that they haven't experienced the good boring, the clearing of Brian Eno's music for airports or music for films or going out into nature or whatever and having those, maybe there's so much social stimulation that we don't have the epiphanies that affirm our dignity. Yeah, Is it, maybe, do you understand what I'm saying? No, I understand. And maybe, maybe we could call that boring. Maybe it's the opposite. I mean, if we're talking about opposite of the quote unquote good boring, maybe a bad boring is just being constantly stimulated by banal things that you're just kind of left going to the next thing, going to the next thing, going to the next thing, that you're afraid to just not be stimulated anymore. Well, yeah, Kierkegaard talked about this precisely. I think we're talking, we're running into Kierkegaard stuff. He called this the, the aesthetic stage of existence. And he said that, and I, we've talked about this in other podcasts and stuff like that, maybe specifically on the one that we did on aesthetic gluttony or whatever, mm -hmm. is that individuals get so gluttonous for that constant stimulation that they become utterly banal they, they they become so alienated from themselves he actually says um 
that they despair and they don't even know it. So like, there's like this like good life that's being portrayed out there or whatever. But like he says, like, no, underneath it all, there's this like unconscious despair that like, everyone is totally miserable. So then does that imply that there are certain musics that would create this sort of banal despair without knowing it moment? Or is it more in the the ear of the beholder or in the person perceiving the art? I think you would have to say that the flashy, non-substantive, easily templatized pop music is is that. Is the... Mm. Like, is, is is the musical analogy of the nightclub or the bar where it's just too it's just too much for you to actually have the real true but, insights? But could you have? But could it be boring in a good way that it that maybe having it be banal gives you space to actually contemplate it further? No, or maybe yeah. I mean I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm getting postmodern. No, 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 here, no, no, no. But I think I think you know if you have something where the form is pretty definable and it's I mean I mean it's like kind of just like surface level that maybe you can have deeper insights about what these things mean for culture oh what does it mean to be human i mean all these different i can't really think of examples right now but perhaps having having transparency maybe isn't so much a bad thing maybe it's more so what you do with it yeah, I think you. I think you can become numb to this stuff, right? Like, sure. like if you're if there's constantly like Katy Perry, Taylor Swift, Adele, or whatever, like playing in the background of the mall or whatever, you start to maybe psychologically tune it out, mm-hmm. and then that creates the space. Like it, it becomes if if those songs sort of become part of the general sort of studium of existence, where um, they're as significant as a tree in nature or an ant in nature where they cease to have any sort of aesthetic power over you. Mm-hmm. And sure, I could see you having some distance from that and they become, and they, they're giving you the same kind of space that maybe some of the glacial sort of uh, ambient music or just going out in nature would. But I, I, I don't know. I, th- I, th- I think that's possible. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if we were to sort of recapitulate that a little bit, right, then maybe we found a new sort of, boring right we've got we we've got the beautiful boring of the thing that gives the clearing that allows us to precipitate inspiration right mm-hmm. and then there's like the what we, we were calling like the boring boring this templatized music where it doesn't re- <coughs> it doesn't really invigorate the soul in any way and any if it, it makes us feel sort of crappy mm-hmm. about ourselves but then there seems to be this new thing there's there seems to be this movement that we can make away from it where if we have the right sort of psychological comportment, we can use that as a space to allow for us to have the yeah. insights again. Maybe again, maybe that goes to this idea of just being able to notice things differently or to be able to take experiences and try to change them, you know, by seeing them differently or thinking them differently, but by maybe creating that space ourselves. Mm-hmm. All I can think of is is that John Cage anecdote, and maybe I've I've explained it in another podcast. I can't recall, but um, he was talking to another composer. Um, I believe it's Morton Feldman. I can't remember, but Morton Feldman was was getting a little annoyed by the radios all around. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It's just kind of like. This is really annoying, John. I can't stand it. And maybe that's sort of our banal, perhaps. Or maybe Feldman thought it was a banal sort of experience. That, oh, more of this damn radio. Yeah, the the damn racket. I can't think straight. Make me and not think straight. And then, you know, John Cage is like, you know what? Like, I started like that. I, I started, you know, I was like, yeah, radios are kind of annoying. But then what I did was. I tried to reconcile that, and cre- I created a piece of music around radios themselves. By you know, by you know, that the performers had radios and they would you know dial in whatever. So then he says, "Okay, so like once I did that, whenever I heard radios anywhere, 
I wouldn't get annoyed because I'd be flattered because they're playing my music. Mm. So I, I think, I mean, that that little story for me kind of, to me, embodies this idea, this maybe this different kind of boring, or maybe not a different kind of boring, but of trying to find the good boring in things by not maybe going to a kind of, um, I think, what David Foster Wallace talks about in that great commencement speech as a kind of just um, self-driving kind of, I, I'm losing, I'm losing the word. Um, well, he talks about it in that, I think he talks about it in that speech where he like, he does, he, he wants you to be able to think so you sort of, I, you can be, what he means about the liberal arts education, if I, if I can recall it correctly, um, that like he wants you to be able to think so that when you train your attention in the very banal aspects of life that you can still find some beauty in it or you can still find you can still find some sort of higher thing to concentrate yeah, on. Yeah, and not going into a kind of already kind of um depression or malaise. Depression, malaise or any kind of um I'm trying I'm try the word escapes me though when you you you're kind of already going you're sort of already moving already. It's a kind of self. Um, oh my god! Propagating or self-propagating, <laughs> or just, or just almost kind of not not self-serve, but you're kind of already. Oh god damn it! No, this is. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Where it's just, it's just you could you just go straight to oh this is banal or this is totally boring or you know reflexive maybe yeah, yeah maybe reflexive yeah. state yeah thank you that was, yeah but yeah maybe we're we're where you kind of have to think about it and and maybe having a different perspective or being able to find the beautiful boring in things is maybe, maybe everything is beautifully boring, but we just have to kind of perceive it that way or that maybe... maybe well, there, you know. there's certainly been a lot of artists who have done that, right? I mean, specifically, I think of Andy Warhol, mm -hmm. right? Like, sure. I mean, he, uh, he obviously took like the things that were utterly banal and part of like sort of the furniture of our everyday lives and and repurpose it and try to turn it into works of, works of art. I mean, and I mean, I think what, who, who does this better than anybody else is I love like the way like, um, DJ culture has, um, uh, has taken all these things that are like utterly commonplace and totally banal and reconfigured it into a way that's really invigorating in times of music. I mean, uh, DJ shadow was mm -hmm. probably, probably has motivated me more as a music producer and musician than, anybody, but than really anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that's been the, the, the repurposing, the re, the, the appropriation of those things can definitely lead to really beautiful. So things. then with that in mind, does that mean that nothing is inherently the bad boring or is the bad boring more so just a kind of reflexive, state that we put ourselves into i don't think anything is inherently bad boring like so many of the conversations that we've had like we've did we were talking about schiller or somebody else like the beauty is in us it's not in the object so much and i think what we have to um what we have to figure out is um what we what we have to what we have to figure out is like how to train ourselves in such a way that we can find the beauty wherever we are. Right. And I don't, so I, I mean, whether it's, I mean, you could probably make a work of art out of that bar scene. You could really, you can make a work of art out of the rave. You can make a work of art out of the, out of the pop song some way. It's just going to be depending on how you comport yourself with it. Mm -hmm. But I think essential to all of it is distance and space and solitude and then you can sort of come back down and, and, and slice it up and carve it up and, and piece it back together in whatever way that you like. But, I mean, I think essential to all of it. I mean, I don't know how you have inspiration with that, that amount of sociability without some distance to it. I mean, I don't know. I don't think, I'm, I don't think inspiration works like that. I mean, maybe, maybe I don't know. I mean, do you, what do you think? About what? How inspiration works? Yeah, yeah. I think it goes back to that idea of having, of, of constantly being between stimulation and 
contemplation mm -hmm. and that it's a fine line between both that if you have too much of one or if you're exclusively one and not the other then it, I, I don't think it works as well but I mean then again I mean I I don't really know that much about inspiration to think about it or I, I, I don't really think in terms of just oh I have this great idea but I, I do think in this terms of kind of being part of a greater network of, of people and ideas and of kind of working off that, whether that means study or whether that means sociability. And maybe maybe you need the time to think about those connections, those you know, that genealogy of ideas or, you know, of of your social network and you need to kind of think about those things by yourself. So then that maybe you can come up with an insight then to bring back to your social network to then maybe propagate more ideas and then maybe somebody will come to you with an idea that they had while they kind of went away for a little bit and then they come back and then this whole and then the whole process is kind of starts again i think maybe i think maybe of inspiration in that sense perhaps yeah more of a network sort of yeah thing. and i think a lot of i mean a lot of what we have to say here is we have to look at the crowds that we associate ourselves with too mm -hmm. right so like like if we if our crowd is utterly banal, if our crowd is utterly uninspiring, then it's hard to see how the crowd would really inspire us. But I think about, I think about like the, say the, the, the crowd that like you've invited me into, like when you, when you do your, um, when you curate music at, 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 at your university, like those individuals, that social interaction is highly inspiring. So, Perhaps we can say something about the the solitary environments that lead to inspiration, and we can say something about the social environments. It's not just pure so social ability that leads to inspiration, and it's not just pure solitude that leads to inspiration, mm -hmm. but certain distinctive kinds of solitude and certain distinctive kinds of sociability that are that precipitate that mm -hmm. that that positive feedback. I do want to go back to you're saying how some people. So you're saying. Banal, you went. You were saying like, oh, like some people are banal, like the crowds you hang out with. So you're saying that people can be banal. That it's not. I find a lot of people banal. I hate mm. to say that. I mean, it's probably that's probably though, a failing. Though, though perhaps maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe you have to try to find the interest. Well, and that's what everybody great everybody has. Yeah. Everybody, everybody has something to offer. Yeah. Like, and that, and that's look the great novelists, the great, the great cinematographers, the great artists can find the beauty in everyone. I'm being lazy when I say that. I'm being lazy. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, no. I mean, right, I, think, but, I think it's a really fascinating way to look at I mean, that's another great way to look at it too. Laziness, where it's just like, eh, boring, this is boring, 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 where maybe, like you said before, maybe we're asking too much of the art and asking too much of the art and asking less of ourselves yeah. as listeners. And that's, what they, and that's what Wallace was saying in that Kenyan college commencement yeah. speech is that that it's like no it's on you to to have a, a life that isn't filled with such boredom you yeah. know or to take that boredom and to make it into a good a good kind of boredom where it's yeah. like yeah this is this is what my life is made up of but look at all the joy that you know not the joy and all the possibility that comes with it including the music where maybe if you're bored with americana maybe you can find a kind of poetry maybe in in these kind of love songs or in these kind of, you know, um, yay America, let's drink some beer sort of song. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can find some kind of, oh, that's really interesting about patriotism and binge drinking. What is the connection there? That's really fascinating. Like, when you can go into these kind well, you, of wormholes you, of just, of ideas, like, oh, well. You know, there are people who make whole careers out of that. You know, some a person that's kind of an ins inspiration to me, Zizek does this. Mm. You know, I, Zizek does this all the time. I like, I'll, I'll watch Zizek videos on like YouTube or something like that. And he'll say something very profound about Lacan or Marx or something like that. And then like, he'll go off on, he'll wax philosophical about like Batman. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, like, like you're so brilliant. Why are you, why are you, why are you trying to find philosophical significance in Batman? And there are other people that do this. Like, um. Uh, was her name Camille Paglia? She she yeah. is a cultural. Anyone who's there are so many people who are like pop culture critics and theorists. 
I think Susan Sontag may have, may have done this a little bit too. I'm not as familiar with her body of work. I mean, but I'm I'm sh I'm sure she. Had, she did have a book on photography, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there are lots of people. I know. I should give her a shout out. Um, I I have a friend who I met through a, a, a program on T. S. Eliot, who um, is utterly. Um, just transfixed by the the Kennedy universe, by the, like JFK, Bobby, and sure, Jackie along, O, yeah. and and we met over in England, and where I live now is you know, Jackie O used to live out here, and um, she took an interest in that, and she just finds such rich complexity in something that I would just like I don't think twice about, like like she, she, you know I I passed I today I passed by a church that Jackie O built out here and I, I I didn't I didn't think twice about it it's just part of where I am but mm -hmm. for my friend she would she she would find such richness she would she'd probably encircle that place and inspect every single thing I've never been inside of it mm -hmm. so maybe yes yeah, so maybe maybe the conclusion here especially you know in regards to experiencing quote unquote boring music or pop music is that maybe we do have to ask more of ourselves as listeners that Perhaps we shouldn't complain so much about music, which sounds, it's, this seems so antithetical to who we are as, you know, as consumers and producers of art, but perhaps we have to ask more of ourselves as listeners and not really, like, discredit the art that we receive, which sounds, again, it sounds weird saying that, but maybe there is something to that where maybe we can find the beautiful in anything, but we well, just yeah, have to I try get, really hard. We had, you know, you have to try harder, try harder. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. I guess I should see, I guess I should see the next time that a Taylor Swift song comes on as an intellectual challenge for me to find an enriching life experience. Right. And maybe, yeah. And, and I think maybe the problem with that too is almost as if having that kind of thought process maybe implies that it's bad. And that you're saying, oh, well, I'm going to find joy out of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like you're like, well, I have a toothache, but I'm just going to try to, like, make the best of it. I don't think I don't think we're trying to judge. I don't think when we're saying this, we're trying to judge the work already. We're just saying that in any experience that you have, <coughs> we're, I guess we're saying it's more neutral. Like, any experience that you can, it could be boring, but that you can also find joy in it as well. Yeah, I mean, Kierkegaard said, you know, something to the effect that the, the expansive powers of the human imagination um, were such that, like, man could find joy in nearly anything. Like, yeah. he, he's, there's a scenario where um, he imagines a man who's imprisoned and is, like, he, he has nothing in his cell but, like, spider webs. Mm -hmm. And he takes such delight in watching the spiders build their webs and admiring their craftsmanship. But had he not been locked in that prison cell, he never would have admired the spider webs. So the, 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 the joy and the enjoyment in the most banal situations, like you said, comes back to our own imaginative powers. God, maybe we have to be locked in that cell in order to enjoy well, maybe many, things. Yeah, yeah. I, it seems like many of us are locked in the cell, but we haven't cultivated the imaginate, imaginative oh. organ to, 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 to combat the despair that comes from the result of the imprisonment with the, the, the banality. <laughs> That's so cool. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, oh. it, it seems like that might be the case. I want to end on that. That's right. so awesome. All right. Gosh. All right. Next week, guys. Bye. <laughs>